We actually launched the very first time in Latin America the IOD International Certificate and Company Direction, the first of our unique chartered qualifications. So really groundbreaking for Latin America, certainly groundbreaking for Chile, and we've had a fantastic partner in board actually bringing this sort of vision into reality. So I'd just like to welcome all of you on behalf of the IOD, INVEST, and also board as well. Now I'm going to hand over shortly to our first uh, speaker this morning, which is Andrew Main Wilson, who will really introduce you to the event and set the scene of really what we're going to be covering in this morning's session. But by way of background, Andrew has 25 years experience of enhancing premium quality brands. He's worked from entrepreneurial startups right through to major multinational brands, including Thompson Travel, Thomas Cook, and Citibank Diners Club, for example. And he was brought to the IOD with the task of transforming the brand into the world's leading organisation for directors. What a nice mission to inherit. But I'm pleased to say that actually today, we have in excess of 40,000 members in over 100 countries and we continue to expand both in terms of membership and also in terms of professional development. Now Andrew's interviewed many famous business leaders over the years, the likes of Bill Gates, Jack Welsh, and even people like Desmond Tutu, a real variety of different uh, business leaders and different celebrities and really gained an insight not just to the UK business environment but also overseas as well. And Andrew doesn't just work at the IOD, he also is a very active non-executive director but I think most interestingly is a passionate professional travel photographer. He's completed assignments in over 145 countries and is currently on course to become the first person to shoot and tell the story of the world's top travel wonders in all of the world's 200 countries. He was born here in London, he holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from University of Birmingham and has also studied at the world leading Harvard Business School. So please provide a very warm welcome to our Chief Operating Officer of the IOD, Mr Andrew Main Wilson. Wow, thank you for that, Ryan. I must have you introduce me things more often. That is a, a wonderful introduction. And if I'm looking for a new girlfriend, I'm definitely going to uh, definitely take you along to introduce me there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our, our period building, our headquarters um, in London. I, I, was very, I was on holiday in Chile a couple of years ago uh, and enjoyed many of your wonderful period buildings in Valparaiso and Santiago, and I hope you very much uh, enjoy this one. We're very proud that we already enjoy a long Standing relationship with the Chilean Navy who hold their big annual cocktail reception here every year and I think have done that for the last 10 to 15 years. So having, uh, having had a great relationship built already with the Chilean military, um, we're very pleased to welcome the business and financial community here. I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes um, really about the theme of, of growing an international brand and, and building corporate government relationships in, in all the world's major and emerging markets, which really is very much a, a theme of, of today for, for, for Chile. Um, as Ryan said, we're, we're the world's leading organisation for business leaders and we have 40,000 members in over 100 countries. So what we're very much trying to do ourselves is build the world's number one premium brand for business leaders right across the world and our vision will be that the brand will comprise uh, members who have got high professional um, training standards and governance standards right across the world such that a member in Chile um, can contact a member in China and do business um, and discuss best practice corporate governance trade together all through the auspices of an IOD so we're absolutely delighted that this is our, our first foray to formal partnership um, in Latin America uh, it's gone extremely well so far and we're delighted that our first training sessions will continue if we start with, with the importance of corporate governance, it, it's not just in some of the major superpower emerging markets. And, and the two examples I regularly quote from the recent months are the fright that Walmart have had in the States 
um, where actually angry shareholders have taken out advertisements in national newspapers starting to criticise the largest and most powerful retailer in the world who would have thought they were impregnable to most corporate governance uh, scandals. And all, I think, all this relates to, this will not have been seen by the existing board of directors coming because this relates to some alleged bribery in the opening of one store in Mexico many years ago. And so it just shows that however professional the country or however professional the multinational, um, you are never, never away from corporate governance standards issues and you've got to keep those standards up at all times. Um, the other perhaps better known corporate governance issue that's gone right across the world, of course, um, is the whole issue surrounding Rupert Murdoch's media empire. But I think that has once again shown that corporate governance standards need to go right down into your middle managers and make sure that best practice best performance um, is taking place at all levels. For us, we feel that there are four key issues for international companies and international directors uh, and ambitious countries to consider. The first, and very much our subject for today, of course, is corporate governance excellence. The need for high standards, particularly to attract foreign inward investment of, of countries ambitious to grow. But secondly, that that has to be backed up by individual director training, and hence our relationship um, that Ryan has built uh, with board. You've got to put the training in place you can put corporate governance standards in place, but if you don't follow it through with the individual director and senior manager training, it's just not going to be um, embedded in either a nation or in individual directors and companies. Thirdly, the importance of building a global business partner network, and hence our ambitions with IED International to build a network of directors right across the world who help and network with each other. And then fourthly and finally, the, the provision of knowledge and the importance and help very much now by the internet, the ability to provide corporate governance training and business information on a global scale to every corner of the world, largely delivered through the internet and for ourselves, our, our own magazine director. Just finally, before I, I hand over, um, I just wanted to, to make you think about where you feel Chile stands on the world stage in terms of trade and how that governance can drive those standards. Um, this is the, the 2011 world rankings in, to in terms of total GDP and, and we see Chile in a pretty good strong position but I personally feel that you have um, great further potential to come further up that ranking of the world's 200 countries. Clearly there are some Latin American countries ahead largely due to either oil or size of nation. If you then look at those same world rankings in terms of GDP per capita, you proudly see Chile sitting in second place, you know, marginally behind Argentina, and surely that goal is very soon within your grasp to be on a GDP per head of population basis, the top country in Latin America. On that positive note, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over now to um, Guillermo Tagle, who is going to introduce to you our panel for today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. Uh, I just want to give you a, a, quick, um, a, a quick introduction to what we will do uh, today. And the reason why, uh, when we were organizing this event at Invest, it became a very good uh, opportunity to make this uh, meeting. We know and we have heard for many years that Chile has one of the best uh, corporate governance uh, uh, structures in, in our country, among, among Latin America, among emerging markets. But today we are trying to move ahead and be part of the development markets uh, community. As a result of that, obviously, we need to improve our corporate governance uh, within, within our country. We have had uh, some improvements uh, recently as a new regulation for corporate governance that was uh, approved uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we have had, uh, in addition to that, several uh, corporate events that has increased a lot uh, the corporate governance awareness or the, the concern of, of uh, board members in Chile companies regarding what may be the risks and challenges that they have to face so that, that was how uh, the idea of taking the chance of doing this event while we were doing the Chile Day uh, in London 
became very uh, attractive because uh, we had this invitation by board and by the, the Institute of Directors to uh, uh, make us all uh, have a chance to be here this morning and to have a chance to discuss through a panel and through a presentation of our uh, authority about this uh, issue. So I would just uh, try to uh, uh, thank you in any way because of the hospitality that we have had in this uh, lo in wonderful location and we'll give uh, uh, the, the next uh, pass to the, our, our panel that we will uh, organize uh, during this uh, morning and Mr. Alberto Chegaray is uh, the one that will be running the panel so I will invite the panelists to come uh, over the, the table and to, to start with our discussion. Alberto will make the presentations. Thank you, Guillermo. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Nicolas. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to this panel to discuss corporate governance and board functioning in UK and in Chile. My name is Alberto Chegaray. And I'm a director at board, Centre for Corporate Governance, and also I'm a director of INVEST. Um, well, for the first time this year, Chile Day, as Guillermo was mentioning, uh, was in fact Chile Two Days. Uh, yesterday was a long but productive day of panels and discussion at Mansion House, where several panels addressed how competitive is Chilean financial market. But in best, we believe that it was necessary to have an additional time to talk about another important factor for Chilean reliable finance, some corporate governance practices among those companies in the market. So it's impossible to be at a, very, a, bit, at a better place than at the Institute of Directors at this magnificent, magnificent building next to a bar <laughs> to discuss some of the main issues regarding corporate governance. This panel is oriented to understand which are the key corporate governance issues for British and Chilean companies have been facing the, 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 during the last uh, uh, period. Um, we believe that the best way to address that goal is by sharing that with director's views from both, country, both countries. For that reason, we have a, a great group of panelists today. We're very proud, three of them, they're sharing their views with us. Uh, let me present them. Uh, Graham Leach, at the end of the table. Graham is a chief economist and director of policy at the Institute of Directors, which he joined in 1998. <laughs> He's also visiting professor of economic policy at the University of Lincoln. In 2006, he was appointed to the Shadow Chancellor's Commission for Tax Reform. And before joining the IOD, he was economic director at Hindley Center, analy analyzing future economic and social change. And previously, Graham has also worked as economic advisor to the Scottish Provident Investment Group and as a senior economic consultant with Pieda. Um, next to him is uh, Gerardo Jofre. Most of the people of Chile know him. Well, Gerardo is a commercial engineer from Universidad Católica. He was served as a director at DSA and San Pedro Vineyard from 1999 to 2004. He served in several senior positions at Santander Group, including chairman. Uh, director and second vice chairman of Banco Santander Chile and insu insurance director for Latin America. He also was chairman of Suma Ban Santander Pension Fund and chairman of Banco Mercantil del Peru, among other <coughs> positions. Current is the director of Endesa Chile and Constumar. And finally, his most important public role, he was appointed chairman of Codelco, big Chilean copper state owned company. Nicholas Brooks, next to me. Uh, Nicholas was appointed to the board of De La Rue Company in March 9, 1997. 
and became chairman of the company with effect in July 2004. Educated at Harold, Nicholas is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Nicholas was also chief executive of Spirit from 1996 until his retirement. And he's a right director of Corporación Financiera Alba, director of Axel Johnson, and the Institute also has uh, board member of the Institute of Directors. He was previously, previously a vice president of Texas Instruments and president of the Materials and Controls Group. What he doesn't mention in his presentation is that Nicholas is also completely fluent in Spanish. He's married to a. And I'm completely. <laughs> Nicholas, it's an honor to have you present today. Well, let's go with the questions and the panels. A great bunch of people here. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with, with us. Uh, let me start with, uh, with our host today, Graham. Uh, you are a well recognized economist in UK. Um, so it would be pretty interesting to know your view about uh, you, the current crisis in, uh, in Europe, the, the crisis in, in UK, and how boards uh, in UK are facing this crisis. Which kind of practices are, are facing them because of the crisis? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. And can I also add my words of welcome to the IAD this morning? It's good to see so many people that I saw in Santiago earlier this year. So thank you for your hospitality there, and it's, it's good to see you here now. Um, well, we're, we're meeting on a very interesting day, or at least at the end of a very interesting seven-day period, with the Euro crisis, where very late in the day, the European Central Bank last week decided to print money, which we said was the way out of this crisis. We never quite believed they'd get there. They've still not quite got there, um, but it does highlight in conjunction with the German Constitutional Court meeting today to decide whether some of these rescue mechanisms are actually legal for the Germans, full stop. It means we're in a very uncertain economic period, and it's an uncertain global economic period. This is not a problem which is merely confined to the Northern Hemisphere. It is something which is, has massive re reverberations and ramifications for the Southern Hemisphere as well. And so this is a very interesting day. Hopefully we can work our way through this Euro crisis, but it's certainly not over yet. But what it does highlight, I think, is just the sheer scale of uncertainty and the, the difficult operating environment in which companies do have to make decisions. Boards responsible for strategy are having to look forward and look ahead with so many uncertainties that are almost an inbuilt tendency to be cautious, to postpone decisions, to delay that investment decision or that recruitment or employment expansion. So it's a very difficult period for us on the economic front, I think, not just in the UK or in Europe, but around the world. Huge prospects, huge growth going on at the same time, of course, in the emerging markets, which is great, and that is offsetting some of the weakness in the advanced economies. But let's not be too complacent here. There are real, real challenges around the globe here, even for those companies operating in fast growth economies. So we have that post-financial crisis pressure. The fact that in the wake of a financial crisis, economic recoveries are always weak. It's a pretty iron law of economic history, that. And that has implications for how you run your companies, how confident you can be about future expansion. Ultimately, of course, you often just make the decision because you can't delay things too far. But in the current environment, there is a real incentive for boards to take a cautious route. And sometimes, of course, that can be the wrong route. The risk is what is required to reap a reward as well in a business in the long term. So we have this post-financial crisis factor putting real pressure on companies. And I would say there are two other points as well. The other one is quite simple, and Andrew alluded to it in one of his slides, and that is we're in a 24-7 media environment, fast connectivity, where issues and stories can go viral very, very quickly indeed, where something starts with a little bit of chatter and then a billion people around the globe know about it within 24 hours. What's more, they have framed a view and they have formed a view on the basis of all that chatter, which may be very ill-informed and may be very inaccurate, but they've formed that view. And if you're the company on the wrong side of that view or that opinion, you have a problem. And so 
corporate governance there and being absolutely squeaky clean is a huge challenge because if you get it wrong, everybody's going to know about it very quickly in a way that they wouldn't 10, 15, 20 years ago. So is that juxtaposition of the media angle, of the constrained economic environment. And I just had a third element as well, and that is the politicians. Because in the wake of the financial crisis, governments around the world have spent a lot of money. They've run up some very big deficits indeed. Politicians in the wake of financial crisis naturally like, or in the wake of any crisis, like to show they're going to intervene and they're going to do something. They don't like to just sit there and do nothing, although often that is probably the, the best thing they could do. If you haven't got any money, how do you do that? Well, that can involve obviously greater regulatory intervention, greater trying to influence in terms of trying to shape the nature of companies, com company boards. All those interventionist measures come to the fore when politicians feel a pressure to do something, but they don't have any money to do it. And so those three factors, I believe, come together in a way it is fairly unique. I wouldn't describe it as a perfect storm. I don't think it is a perfect storm. I wouldn't say it was that serious or that grave. But what I would say is there are some fairly unique pressures coming together all at once, which pre pre presents companies with real challenges. But of course, if you overcome those challenges and you get it right, you've got a real competitive advantage as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Um, <coughs> Gerardo, I will come to you now. Uh, I have to say thank you, Gerardo, for, for here today. I, I know you, you travel from Vladivostok, Russia, to be present here in this panel, so thanks a lot for, uh, for being here. Uh, well, let me start by asking you uh, what should be the most important notice of Codelco in the last, I don't know, years. Uh, it's, it's, it's recent contractual agreement with, with Anglo American. I, I'm pretty sure I'm Almost everyone in this room uh, knows that it, it probably requires a lot of teamwork, uh, a lot of, between Codelco's board and, and management. Um, it's, it's not a common issue, this teamwork uh, under new corporate governance, governance law for, for Codelco. I, 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 would, I guess it would be pretty interesting to, to know your views. Uh, how was this experience from your chairman's perspective? Thank you very much, Alberto, <coughs> and thank you very much to, to the Institute of, of Boards for this very warm and, and, and fantastic hospitality to us today. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. Well, um, this, this case has been, um, uh, I, I would say that we, 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 we feel very happy because we have been able to reach a win-win settlement with our friends of Anglo-American and it has been so win-win that we are we have been able both sides of of, of uh, constructing a, a, a very a very important friendship and partnership for the future and I would say that this uh, I, I will not enter into details on, on the settlement but uh, the, the long-term consideration of this settlement is very important because we are we have our our mine operations in Chile uh, with these particular mine operations who were uh, 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 subject to, to this conflict they are together in the same or uh, body then it is it is really uh, one mine that we are sharing between the two companies. Then it is very important for, for both companies to, to reach uh, um, a, a, a settlement who makes possible a collaborative and, 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 and a collaborative future work and to be able to develop and create value together with those two companies. And we are very pleased of that. Uh, we, we think we think we think it was it, it has been a very good job for both sides, and 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 and, and I, I know that their feeling is very similar to ours. And I I, I had just a meeting with Sir John Parker. Uh, we have we have had several meetings during the last year, 
and, and we are both very pleased of what is happening with our companies and what the future is for, for our uh, collaborative uh, work together in the, in the next future. We have a lot of opportunities. So, and going to the question of, of, the, of the experience of the new corporate governance of Codelco, um, I don't know whether it would be, uh, well, I think it is, a, it is a very interesting case of study, the one of, of the corporate governance of Codelco, because we have experienced a deep change in the, in, in the corporate governance, which I, I will not detail here because it would be too long. But we had a, we, we had for, for, traditionally we had a certain corporate governance of Codelco and uh, we, 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 we launched a new law and the new law makes some very abstract change in the, in the corporate governance of Codelco. Very abstract change. So, nevertheless, they are highly impactant on Codelco's uh, behavior and in, in Codelco's management, and and that is being uh, it, it is it is it is being perceived uh, when when we when we have when, when we have spent few few more than two years in the new in the new scheme of the corporate gov corporate governance of Codelco. Uh, some people have, have, have commented me that during the former corporate governance of Codelco, this settlement, for example, with Anglo had been totally impossible because of several reasons. Uh, and, and they make some sense to me. Uh, but I think it is, a, it is a, even, uh, even when it is a very particular case, because uh, Codelco is a very uh, Special company. It is a state-owned company. We don't we don't have shares, for example. Uh, th this law uh, makes a sort of um, simulation of um, of a public company, but not it, we don't have shares in, at all. Uh, then it is a, a special case, and so it is not a very good one for um, for 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 uh, getting getting. Uh, conclusions, general conclusions. But uh, since it is so special the case, it is also, I think, very interesting for <coughs> studying, deeply studying this case and uh, learning important things about corporate governance uh, in general. <coughs> uh, well, I, 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 I will later uh, comment what what uh, how uh, are we facing different concepts and different philosophies in corporate governance um, among different markets and countries uh, but uh, I think we have to we have to uh, deeply study those differences those different uh, approaches and we, we can get a lot of very important conclusions. Uh, to conclude, I want to say that, in my point of view, the issue of the corporate governance is a capital one. It is very, very relevant, very, very important. And it is very abstract. And we don't have, uh, in, my point of, in, my, in my opinion, we don't have clear conclusions anywhere anywhere in the world. So it is, it is being developed and I think that, that the work that this institute is doing on this topic is of, of a huge, huge importance for the future of, the, of, the, of worldwide companies because corporate governance is too, too relevant and we have to deeply analyze what, is, what, what the alternatives are uh, and to and to 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 arrive to to general recommendations or conclusions will not be that obvious as as, as sometimes we think. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Gerardo. <coughs> um, Nicolas, uh, after your relevant management experience as chief executive of, of Spirit and now as chairman and director of several European companies. Um, do you think a balance between executive and non-executive directors 
can improve effectiveness at board level. Uh, let me tell you that, well, as you maybe already know, in Chile, commonly, all board members are non executive So it's a, it's a huge difference between UK and, and Chile. Thank you very much, Alberto, and good morning, everybody. A long time ago, when I became uh, a young CEO, I thought, well, why on earth do I need a chairman? Why do I need a board? You know, I'm running this company, these non executives they've done nothing about my business. But I've grown up since then, especially as I've become a chairman myself, actually. <laughs> Uh, one does need one, um, and uh, there is in fact, uh, uh, not only is it necessary, and I'll explain from a business point of view why it's necessary, but also even the latest UK corporate governance code requires at least uh, half of your board members are independent uh, and non-executive directors uh, on it. And, and, and why? You know, I've been on, as I say, I've been a CEO, I've been an executive for many years in Texas Instruments and indeed in Spirant. Uh, and then uh, as a non-executive, also on the board uh, of Corporatum Financiava and uh, indeed a private company, a very large private Swedish company, Axel Johnson in, in Sweden, which is a very different way of running a business, but a very good way of running a business, but they still have non-executives uh, themselves as well. And in smaller companies, the UK Corporate Governance Code requires at least, I think, two uh, independent directors on it. Now, why have I changed my mind since then? Because you, you, you select the non-executive directors. Uh, they are independent. They have a wide experience. They come from very different fields uh, uh, on themselves and can contribute, even if they don't know your business intimately, they can contribute with their experience and experiences they've had outside. Uh, they are impartial. They are independent, which is very, very important. And not to no conflicts of interest, or shouldn't be any conflicts of interest with the company that you're uh, that you're a non-executive director of. And uh, they have some special knowledges in many cases. Either they may be lawyers, or they may be accountants, or or, or whatever experience they can bring to the board. Uh, and also. Personalities and personal qualities are very important to be able to communicate and discuss intelligently and honestly and openly uh, as, a, as a board member. Also, I must uh, stress at this time, not just on executives, one ought to look at gender diversity as well. I think it's very important. In Delarue, as a chairman, I brought on two ladies uh, onto the board, extremely experienced ladies, and ex coming from a different angle which we need around the table. You need different uh, inputs. You don't want everybody talking to you in the same language as you are uh, and agreeing with you everything you say. You want a discussion. Trying to, 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 to get results from the establishing of the duties. The results will be uh, what happens in the in the reality and what happens in business. This is like if we were talking about football, we couldn't ask to a to a football player to 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 make the goal, to try to make the goal, to try to 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 win the the match. But we cannot uh, uh, we cannot ask to win the match at any event and in any in, in every case. Then this is a very, a very delicate equilibrium because we have to assure that uh, directors are really uh, fully exercising their, their duty of care, for example, but we have to accept that even fully exercising their duty of care, they could face some problems or, or, or some losses in their, in their companies. And we have to, to, to accept that. And this is a huge challenge for regulators and for authorities because they have to be very well balanced in terms of, of being able to detect when duty of care is not being rightly exercised, but being able also to distinguish that from the results. Because this is very important, not, not only because of a, of a matter of justice, which is, but also because if we uh, if, if we fail in this equilibrium, um, for example, we charge too much the emphasis in the in the duty of care and 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 trying to 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 get results, and we don't uh, take into account the, the the this equilibrium and this balance, we are going to uh, disencourage 
the, the, the participation of good professionals and, and experienced people as member of boards, then that could harm uh, companies and society very, 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 very hardly. Hmm? Then I think in, in, in this term, it is very important this, this balance and, and this good sense, I would say. Um, slightly differently, I think I'd say, um, if we're going to um, model corporate governance maybe on the England football team, then uh, we're going to have we're going to have a few scandals over the coming months. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but um, m more seriously, um, I, th I think one of the key things is that sort of one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Is that there are lessons to be learned across all cultures here as to what the actual model is, and um, we can adapt and we can tweak. We're not going to have a perfectly uniform global corporate governance model here. But what we can do is we can learn from others and we can then apply and implement those changes within our own business environments. And um, I think that's what we, the essence of what the IAD is trying to do here, that we're trying to bring global best practice techniques to a wider audience. Um, but that doesn't mean that all those best practice techniques are sourced from the UK or Europe or wherever. They're going to be ultimately sourced from all around the world. I agree, uh, Graham, that it's not uniform corporate governance around the world, but I do believe there is an, an effort and a, and a movement towards a convergence of corporate governance, as indeed there is a movement towards convergence of accounting standards uh, and reporting, etc. It will happen, and it's starting to happen, and I think that's where uh, all countries can play a valuable part in ensuring that you can go from one country to another and rest assured that you have the same corporate governance in each parts of the world, which is very reassuring for investors. Um, the duty of care is, is general, I must admit, it's very general uh, uh, and to dictate uh, the specific spe uh, recipes of a duty of care of, of directors, but of course in general it does include taking reasonable steps to ensure companies Assets are properly accounted for, properly safeguarded, properly insured, and properly invested. Uh, and reasonable steps is a question. What are these reasonable steps that one should do? Um, there is a formula for reasonable steps. You have to go through the normal induction courses, the training courses, uh, keeping up to date with relevant legislator. Of course, you've got to attend the board meetings, and not only attend board meetings, but even between board meetings, there's items for non-executives to contribute and help and, and, and inquire. Um, there's particular skills, avoid conflicts of interest, not accepting benefits or anything like this. These are standard areas that you should not should certainly avoid and, uh, uh, and do. Um, I think another point of duty of care, uh, I don't in England we see a lot of people that when they retire they become pluralists. They become non-executive directors of a dozen companies because they think they have to attend a board meeting just tick the boxes and go to another board meeting tick those boxes and but the issues occur when something happens you're wanted you're needed and do you have time to be able to dedicate to fix those problems of that company um, and indeed uh, Kodoko you must have had in the last year a, a lot of help or well, your non-executives must have had a lot of board meetings as well in Delarue, we had an issue on, on duty care a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Um, and I believe that we acted as a board appropriately, accurately, and quickly, and efficiently. But we normally have in Delarue 10 board meetings a year. When this incident occurred in, in the summer of 2010, uh, we had, in the six months following that, we actually had 28 board meetings. We normally have 10 board meetings here, 28 board meetings in the period of seven months. Uh, and that required uh, all our non-executives to be there, to help contribute and put the extra time in, without extra money, extra time to be able to resolve the resolutions that we had and the issues we had. It even required me to step in because we lost the CEO, step, step in uh, full time, seven days a week for seven months to uh, help and resolve and fix this uh, serious issue uh, that we had. But the duty of care that we did as a board 
I'm very proud of the non-executives that we had. <coughs> Duty of care that we had with the board was to report the incidents and it was brought to our attention for our own internal controls. Our own internally, we brought this issue to ourselves, to the board. Uh, and as soon as we knew about that, we reported it directly to the customer, straight away, all in honest and good faith, even though the customer didn't like it. We had to tell him what was happening. Um, we'd tell him how we were going to fix it, and we fixed it within a month. We reported it to the legal authorities immediately. Uh, and indeed, looking back at that incident that we have now, the Rue today is a stronger and better company, more trustworthy and honest company, and it's seen by the customers as honest and open uh, and that's a duty of care that every board member should should take uh, and indeed it's a benefit for employees as well so time available time is extremely important you need to have that time don't if you're going to be a 10 non-executive and a pluralist you might as well be a full-time executive and earn real money but uh, uh, and that's another issue with the responsibilities that directors have non-executive directors, same responsibilities as an executive director, getting paid, are they getting rewarded sufficiently well? Are we paying sufficiently well for those responsibilities that they need to take? And that might be more and more of an issue as time goes on. Um, but directors that are required to exhibit such a degree of skill uh, as, as may be reasonably expected from a person with their knowledge and their own backgrounds. Uh, and that's, how can you define that in even more details? It's very difficult but reasonable steps you should be taking to protect the assets of the company. Thank you. Uh, pretty interesting answers. Uh, you know, the, most of the people in the room is uh, from to the financial sector. Uh, we are here because we want to, to share our strength as a market uh, for London community. Uh, I think it would be pretty interesting uh, from your point of view, Graham, Nicholas, but, but also from, from Gerardo's point of view, oh, in UK opinion, in the, in the British opinion, which kind of practices, uh, in corporate governance practices, uh, are British investors looking uh, at companies in Chile, for, in, or in, the, in worldwide, not only in Chile, but worldwide? Come on first then. Um, it, it, it's very important. I think first of all you look at the countries. There are countries around the world which have a perception of being poor corporate governments and therefore you've got to be very careful. Chile, there's a perception, there's a, a, a corruption perceptions index. Every year it's taken into account yes. and it's run by a, 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 an NGO um, and, and people trust, trust. trust the barometer. And Chile, in 2011, came number 22 out of 178 countries. And they've been improving every single year in their corruption index perception. So you look at that first. In fact, funnily enough, the United States were 24th. Not, not, and Chile were ahead of the United States in this perception index. Uh, but, so you look at the country, and that, that tells you a barometer. Then you have to look at the company, if you're going to invest in the company. And most UK institutions today uh, put corporate governance now on par with financial performance uh, in, when evaluating potential investments. Uh, it's become that serious and that problematical. Investors do not want to invest or risk their investment in a company which might have run into trouble and get a bad reputation, etc., and it pulls back onto yourself. So it's equal, equal I think, uh, parameters now when you're looking at investing in uh, those areas. Chile, I think, is a, is a great example, really, how you are leading, the United, the, the, especially the Americas and the United States, you could say, uh, in, in the war against corruption. The way you deal with fraud, you know, and the way the legislation is coming out is, is admirable, and it sits, gives reassurance to uh, investors, foreign investors, that they can invest in the company. And the political situation is stable, has been stable now for decades. Uh, Chile has everything going. It's a shining star, really, in which to uh, for an investor to invest in, because of what you've been doing and what we've been seeing uh, happen compared to many many other countries. So. Uh, the other aspect you look at uh, when investing in a company, of course, is their corporate governance. What is their t 
total transparency, where the total transparency of financial disclosures, total transparency of the notes to accounts of contingent liabilities, transparency in how you manage risk, transparency on how you conduct your internal audit, who does the internal audit report to? Do you have an audit committee independent? And does that report to the board? All these lines are, are proper procedures of corporate governance of how you would control a company that we would look at if we were investing uh, in, in a company, apart from the financial performance, of course, that uh, is e in equal importance. So Chile, I think Chile should be proud of where you are, what you've done, and I think to continue, uh, you've got a great opportunity now to continue on that path and really become the shining star, not just the Americas, but for the global uh, uh, global world, and particularly the US and, U and, and, and the UK. Um, well, I think, I think Nicholas has highlighted the key factors there. I mean, the perceptions um, index and the importance of that, I think, is, is crucial. Uh, and the transparency issue. I think I would also add the, the whole issue of comparability. I, I said before that, you know, whilst we don't want necessarily one size fits all, um, again, the convergence there over time is a factor which obviously is, is looked for uh, and, and, and helps. I think I would just add one final factor as well, which is a slightly more general and rounded aspect to this, but clearly relates back in to corporate governance, and that is just indications of the quality of management full stop. Nicholas mentioned um, uh, a Swiss, uh, sort of Nordic model earlier, and the examples you can get from that. And I think there are some very, very powerful examples because people look at some of the Nordic economies and they think these are he heavily state intervention economies. They're not as dynamic and fleet as, as, as you'd wish. But actually, if you look at things like the, the World Economic Forums and the competitiveness indices, the Nordic countries are right up there with the quality of government, uh, with the quality of management and, uh, and corporate governance measures there. So quite often as well, economies which you don't expect to have actually really a very sort of first league uh, performance actually really do have that. And um, I've done quite a bit of work on the Nordic economies over recent years, and it is very impressive so, um, some of the management uh, levels they achieve there. Um, and, um, and so, again, best practice can be sourced from a variety of, uh, of places. You know, well, I would, I would like to comment about this, uh, that in, in different, in different uh, regions of the world, we have very different uh, philosophies of corporate governance. Then, for example, in, in, the, in the case of Chile, in, 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 I'm making a parallel with, with the case of UK, we have very important differences, uh, and philosophical differences, in what we are, and, and in what our, uh, what our concepts are in relation to corporate governance. For example, in the case of Chile, uh, the, the, the boards are non-executive. The whole, the, the, the whole board is composed by, by non-executive persons. Even more, most of Chilean boards, uh, they don't have the CEO within the board. The, the CEO is in front of the board, he's not a member of the board, he doesn't have vote in the board, and, and the board is, uh, is, is his, his authority. Hmm? Then it is a different concept of, of, the, of the most common concept that we are, not only in the UK, but, but also in, in general, in, in, general in, the, in, in, in the OECD countries, we find that you, almost in every, in every case the CEO is a member of the board and also there are some executive members of the board uh, together with some non-executive members. Then this, uh, those two concepts of boards are very different. I don't know which is better because they have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but we have to take into account this and we have to to deepen our, our, our understanding of what the, what the effects are of those two concepts because we, 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 we could change. In Chile we could, we could evolve to, to another, to another um, philosophy but we should be very clear what, what are we going to, 
uh, to to look for in, uh, if we decided to to do to do such a change. Uh, personally, I am not sure we would we would we would should change this concept. I am not sure. I, I think our concept has. Uh, very interesting values and very interesting. Uh, uh, it, 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 it gives very interesting uh, results to to our companies. But I think we have to to think to deeply think of this. Uh, for example, the other example we were discussing with Nicholas uh, before the the panel. It is the, it is the the, the way which uh, board members are generated in UK and in Chile. In Chile, there is just uh, there is a, a single voting process where every shareholder uh, has his votes and he votes for 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 different persons for different candidates. He can split or, or concentrate his votes, and it is a single process. Then what happens there is that, for example, here we have many many representatives of of the, of the Chilean pension funds. The Chilean pension funds, they they, they have they have shares in, in relevant uh, share participations in 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 several in, in, in most in, or in all all allowed uh, important companies in Chile allowed by the law their their pension law, and they they are able to elect to designate members of the board of those. Uh, of those companies. In my case, for example, I, I have been honored by the China Pension Funds and that they are designated me a member of the board of LATAM Airlines. And we are totally independent member of those boards because we, we don't depend on the, on the controllers for being member of the board. It is, it is a totally different system from the one of UK, where uh, I understand you have a selection one by one, there are as many selections as members of the board, as many elections as members of the board. Then, if you are, a, if if you have a relevant but small share of the of the company, you could not be able of uh, electing no no directors at all. Then the dynamics of this. It's totally different. There, again, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. The, the disadvantage is that it is more difficult to to to, to configure a, a board as a team. It is more difficult to say we wish uh, have these or these skills in the in the board because. Uh, the elections are, are not, 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 not related among them. Uh, the, the election will be what, what result uh, coming from different volunteers. But uh, there are also some advantages. For example, the independence of the, of, the member of, the, of the members of the boards in Chile is very high because they don't have to be, they, have, they don't have to behave in terms of, of the majority. Hmm? They are independent. They, they can vote totally independently because they don't depend on the majority for being members of members of the board, but just to be um, to to get uh, in, uh, votes enough for being able to be elected. Then the dynamic of this of this philosophy, uh, I, I I imagine it ha it must be very different. Uh, under 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 our conceptions than in other conceptions. Uh, taking into account that uh, the the topic of corporate governance is a very abstract one, and also it, it is um, it is something that we are we are concerning more and more every year, and and I think you have as 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 institute of directors here. Uh, you have um, uh, uh, a, a very attractive opportunity of dipping and dipping on on these studies and and, and analysis and comparisons and and development of of of, um, 
ideas, philosophies. Uh, we can, of course, we can live with different philosophies. We, 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 we do that in, in every field in, in human life. Then I think we have to, to, to live with, with different philosophies, but, we ha but it is important to well understand them and go to the point, the point of the question. I think that a foreign investor uh, getting into, into, uh, into a possible country to invest, uh, it is very important to well understand what the philosophy uh, in relation with, with corporate governance is for being able to appreciate where, where, whether, this, uh, whether in this country corporate, corporate govern, governments are working well or not. Uh, because if you try to put them the same pattern that you are accustomed to, perhaps you are going, or, 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 you are going to not understand, not, 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 not rightly understand what is, what is happening in that country, and perhaps you are going to make a bad decision as investor. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, well, there's a lot of intelligent people in this room. I don't want to monopolize all the questions. Um, this is the moment if you want to raise questions to our distinguished panelists, please feel completely free uh, to share your opinions or questions to them. I know I, I, I'm looking at raise hand over there. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I, in, incredibly interesting uh, insight into into the uh, into the various philosophies, as you were saying, uh, um, in how things need to be operated and how they're addressed, uh, both here and in Chile, uh, and indeed generally. I'm particularly interested in the differentiation uh, or the parallel, if I can call it that, uh, that's that's applied in Chile to to what goes on in Central and Eastern Europe with a supervisory structure above an executive structure. And perhaps that's something that might be adopted over here, uh, with the non-execs forming the uh, the majority of the the supervisory board. Um, one of the point of point I really wanted to make was that um, being uh, fundamentally a cynic, I I wondered what your views would be on um, the senior levels of boards in the UK and at government setting an example in terms of ethics. And when the, uh, the duty of care and due diligence is clearly seen to have fallen down, um, requiring the boards to actually resign en masse and be, re and be replaced. Thank you. Any, we're gonna put together some questions. Lionel, please, are you raise your question, do your hand? No. Yeah, there's a microphone for Lionel Lavarria. Uh, I'm Lionel Lavarria, CEO from BCI Bank from Chile. Uh, I, I want to compliment a question to uh, Gerardo. Uh, the point is, the, I see a difference of the concern you have here, the board issues and the regulation issues concerning the management as uh, independent board members. And it, I think it's different from Chile, in which the concern of the authority is more on the minor minority shareholders. How do you, here in, in the UK, how do you solve that problem? Is there an issue? Because the reality in Chile is that most of the economical groups are part of families for many, many years. They run these companies very successful. They are, have very good investments in the region. And uh, I've seen that maybe in some cases in which there was an investment fund and not a controlling group, there, there has been some problems in which uh, governance has failed. Uh, we have a uh, fraud in or different positions, or maybe in some 
international investments has occurred then, which minorities uh, have had a problem, but it's not a common issue in the traditional economic group. How is the situation here in the UK? That's okay with two. Of the, I, I, I'm seeing Jorge raising his hand. Three questions. Okay, Jorge, please. Thank you. I am Jorge Rosen, the chairman of Endesa Chile. Just a quick clarification for our host here. Chile, we do have executive and non-executive members on the board of conglomerates. We may not be executive of the same specific company, but we are executives of the conglomerate. In Chile, the 22 largest companies all have cascade operation. All of them sit on the board of the companies underneath executive position. So yet then you will have, and you do have, and it's legal to have executive and non-executive, not of the same entity, but of the same conglomerate. Thank you. Anyone else? Guillermo. Um, I just want to, to make a question on how this uh, new trend of uh, social networks are impacting the behavior of, uh, of uh, corporate governance. Uh, pre probably in the past, uh, when you look at all the stakeholders uh, related to a company, the shareholders was the concern of the, the board and the uh, consumers were the co of the concern of the commercial area of the company. Uh, and the strength of the consumers were limited to whatever they could do on an 800 number or claiming whatever happens. Now they have Twitter, they have Facebook, and whatever happens with the company becomes a main and a major public concern and can put the board of a company exposed to a public situation. And, and in my view, that that's one of the main threats that has become to 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 be uh, of re really scary to anyone that has a reputation, that has a position in, in, in the society or in its respective market, and that suddenly he can be faced to a situation that is completely out of hand and that was caused because a product failed or, or whatever happened, but, but it jumps up to the, the top position of the company and all the board members may be involved uh, in, in 24 hours into a big mess just because something happened and went to Twitter and the whole uh, country is uh, uh, claiming against the, the company. In your experience, what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, policies or behaviors can, can be taken to, to manage that the, this new uh, environment that we, we are facing and will stay for the future? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Alfonso's raised hands, but I think it's a lot of questions right now for, for our panelists. Let's go with them with this group and after we will follow. Which one of you? I can, I'll, go. I'll do maybe the first question about what happens sort of in the, when the of care fails and, and maybe try and deal with the, the last point at the same time as well. I think uh, the best illustration here is actually the financial services sector where you have the city, an institution, a sector built on that sound corporate governance principle of my word is my bond. Mm -hmm. And you've got, and where you have that breakdown um, in recent years in the city context. We've just seen that the shit, what it costs, the, you know, bank valuations at the present time are not merely a reflection of the financial crisis, they are a reflection as well of, of corporate governance failure. And so the incentive now to get it right, and we do, we often have to overshoot in the wrong direction, we often have to make mistakes, very expensive mistakes, before it shakes people into action. And I think what we're seeing at the present time is the response there. I think it also highlights some of the other difficulties involved here, because Nicholas was alluding, obviously, to the great benefits of having a diverse um, cosmopolitan background on the board, and that's obviously very, very important. But there are obviously limits to how far that can go, and one of the issues in the financial crisis was that you had very complex markets where clearly many people did not under quite understand the degree of risk and exposure of those organizations. And it's how, and as well at the same time as well, you didn't have necessarily transparency within those organizations in terms of um, 
at board level understanding the issues as well. So you have these very complex markets in the financial context, um, potentially a lack of transparency as well. You have these very strong market pressures as well. And really, the failures of recent years were kind of always going to happen in that context. If you have a little model predicting what the outturn would be, it would probably... Now, none of us, of course, saw the scale of it or, or, or saw the, the precise nature of it. But actually, the writing was on the wall there. And I think what we're seeing now, thankfully, is a, is a response to that. Your point about social media and the, the impact of social media. I think in a city context, actually, that will have a very powerful effect. I think it will have a sort of 21st century version of an 18th century, my word is my bond, because you know you are going to get found out in the current uh, environment. And I think that has a very salutary impact on boards. I think that has a very salutary impact on organisations. So I'm actually quite positive looking forward. I think there's been a lot of messes, there have been quite a lot of messes to clear up. Human nature is what it is, so there'll be more messes to clear up in the future. But I think actually we're moving towards a much more positive environment for corporate governance now. Um, and that's all, all to the good. I mean, I think the transparency issue, uh, I think that's a very valid point. Um, well, how, where do you cross the line into a problem? Um, uh, but I think you've got, as Nicholas said, I think you've got to have the right processes, procedures in place so that you can show very quickly that you acted in the right manner. Um, that doesn't mean you reveal everything before the fact, but it does mean that if something occurs, then you are very quickly able to respond and show, look, this is how we function, this is how we operate, this is how we're dealing with this situation. Clearly, there are going to be issues of commercial confidentiality which apply. So you can't, can't do a lot of this stuff in advance, necessarily. But if you have the right procedures in place and you're confident that those processes and procedures work, then you can deal with a problem. Um, it's when you haven't got the procedures, you can't show the email trail and how you got to this position, and nobody's quite sure who's responsible for it, that then that's, that's when the media is going to be all over you because they sniff a problem. Um, but if you're transparent and open, just as in the political domain, um, the stories can be neutralised very quickly by just opening the books and saying, here's what happened. It's when you're cautious about opening the books that people want to ferret around a lot more. <coughs> I would like to comment a little uh, shortly so, uh, about the about the, the information uh, the information topic. Um, we have just uh, faced in Codelco a, 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 a huge challenge of of communications in, because of the because of the settlement with Anglo and during the the conflict and, and at the end of it. Um, uh, I, I would say. That uh, to me, uh, it seems that it is a very good practice to concentrate uh, board communications in the chairman of the board, not not allowing every every director to communicate uh, about the about the company, because it, it, it can get very confusing very, very confusing for the market to to have uh, many different uh, voices uh, speaking in. in in, in, in representation of the of the company, and, uh, and there are some other aspects who have been uh, communicated by the CEO, and even by other executives in some more specific points. Uh, I think I think on, on this uh, we we have to be. It, it, this depends on the uh, on on the situation, also on, on the uh, on the what 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 is the. The contingency of the company, the the way in which uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, they they must organize their communication. For example, for, for example, in the case of of our of, of this uh, deal with with Anglo, we established a, a special committee uh, who was uh, uh, chaired by by one one of the members of the board for dealing with the with the information. With the formation aspect of the of the of the operation, and, and in this in this special uh, committee, it was a mixed com committee where we had uh, members of the boards of the board and also executives working in this committee, and they 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 had meetings very often very often to for 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 um, uh, leading the, the communications issue. Uh, it was a very complex 
com a, a very complex aspect that I, I, I don't want to deep on that, but this was more or less for that situation. But at the end of this case, we uh, terminated the, the, this, this, uh, this committee and it, 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 uh, the, the communications issue went back to the, to the management um, and, and we, we, we returned it to normality. Very briefly. Very briefly. I would like to address uh, the U.S. Uh, company, uh, which is absolutely right. It is different, and from that point of view, U.S. companies and corporate governments they actually codify, it's codified the rules. You have to follow the rules one by one. If you, and there's no exception. In the, uh, in, in the U.K., you do have a chance and suggestion to follow, and if you don't follow it, you explain why you don't follow it in openness and transparency. Why you don't follow that particular rule. Uh, you have that opportunity in the, U in the UK, but you don't in the US. But there are many successful US companies, I'm not saying it's not They're very successful. And, and the other one, quickly, uh, if I may, because it's very interesting as well, is the media and the transparency. Um, I think it's very, very important for companies, um, as well as politicians to many extent, to explain to themselves what their strategy is, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and I, I really rely on, on newspapers and media to actually publish success stories. They're very much interested in publishing negative stories. And uh, we open the business uses negative headlines. But there's some brilliant successes around opportunities around the world, which we ought to be publishing as well. But that doesn't, you must be open and transparent with the media and all circles with the media, as, as well as your employees, as well as your shareholders, etc. etc. Um, I know Minister, Minister Larraín is in the room, but the Chilean ambassador in the UK is in the room. Uh, we are on time for the next uh, part of this activity with the presentation of Superintendent Coloma. But I would want to thank you very much, our great panelists today, Graham, Gerardo, Nicolas. Please give us a. Superintendency of uh, Securities in, in Chile, Superintendencia de Valores, and to make, make his uh, presentation. And if the Finance Minister and the Ambassador want to come and sit here in the front row, oh, they will hear, hear you from the back. So you're welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be in this wonderful place. Um, I think that it is it's a, a very special place to talk about corporate governance, for what is an issue that in our country is increasingly important. Uh, I, I am going to, to talk about uh, this four issues. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk something about the, the standards of corporate governance that we expect. Then some explanation about the Chilean context and how, how do we can explain the present situation, how, how the, regulation, the regulation has evolved through time. And then what is very important is what about the future of corporate governance in Chile? And at the end, uh, some final remarks. About uh, the standards, I think that it's very important to, to note that this is uh, an issue of increasing importance. Uh, and this growing interest for, for high standards uh, have uh, many explanations. Uh, I think that in our case, and also in international, like international world, uh, you see that it's a learning process uh, from some emblematic case. Uh, we, ha we have also all our own emblematic case in Chile. 
everybody in the world, everybody knows some problematic case too. And, and this always uh, makes people to think about the issue and, and make the investor highly interested in, in this issue. Uh, today we are in a situation uh, in which uh, uh, it's increasingly important for the investors and particularly for those who have fiduciary responsibilities to look at the corporate governance. They have a big responsibility to manage the funds of, of third parties and, and they know that the corporate governance is a very important issue. There is also a greater financial integration that explains uh, that the world is integrated and the, the investors have the opportunity to invest in any part of the world and obviously uh, an issue as the corporate governance, how the companies are managed uh, is a very important uh, issue that uh, intervenes in any decision. Uh, and, and also we have, a, as was already uh, remarked in the previous presentation, that we are in a world in which there is an increasing exposure uh, to the corporate governance, uh, to the stakeholders. Uh, uh, the development of the information technologies really has led to a growing scrutiny of, of by market players and also the regulation and development aiming at increasing the transparency uh, in the, the, the amount of information that the, the firms have to give the market makes that all the, the, the information uh, this is higher than, than another moments of the life or the, of the history and, and the board's decisions are must be better justified because there is a lot of more information that stakeholders are increasingly informed there are technologies that permits to obtain in, on, on time or or in the in the networks as somebody talked before here uh, about uh, Twitter, all the technologies, everything spread in, in only a moment. So it is an increasing exposure to the different stakeholders. And this, from my point of view, changed the way in which you have to look at the corporate governance. There are a lot of new challenges that have appeared on this time. The main objective, as I say there, is to promote the adoption of good practices in corporate governance and also, what is very important, to provide more information to the market. The market needs more information about the quality or the good practice that um, the corporate government. What I, I miss to say that all those principles obviously uh, are neither required by law or regulation to boards. It, 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 it makes no sense that we put as a good practice something that the law requires. No, it's referred to another things. Uh, additional practices to, to the ones that, or, or to the duties that the law asks for. Uh, and then a couple of more comments about that, the rule. Uh, it's considered that it's the information about this practice is relevant to the market. Uh, uh, an improvement to this translates in a higher level of confidence among market participants and this wish res which results in a deeper financial market with all the benefits this brings. Uh, and uh, particularly the self-evaluation uh, we have will have to be sent to the SBS, the stock exchanges and to be published in the company website. Uh, and the company uh, will have to self-evaluate once a year. What are the main issues? I'm not going into details, only the, the main four issues that are under discussion or in which are defined good practices uh, are the principles regarding, uh, for example, the appropriate exercise in the role of the role of directors. Huh? This is the, the first issue that, that, is, that is still. Uh, and here uh, is a lot of questions or good practice related with the, the induction process for being direct directors uh, are included in, 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 this, in this first topic. A second topic is the relation between the company and the stakeholders. Basically, it refers to information 
the, 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 the change of information in between the firm and the stakeholders. Uh, the good practice in, in the in the in the send of information to the stakeholders. Then the third topic is related with the policies aimed uh, to key executives, uh, such as compensation and retention policies. And last, uh, there is a topic related with the risk management and the internal control process. Uh, those, those are the four topics in which are organized uh, the different good practice, practices that were defined. And finishing, if I can move the, what is the, ah, where am I? Okay. Thank you. And we have received a lot of comments. Uh, uh, it's not a new for most of people in, in this room. Um, uh, because we have a, we had a consultant period between July and August, uh, and, and the comments that we are received are currently under revision. Uh, as I have said before, uh, this the consultation period was not a cosmetic uh, process. Um, really, is very far with our objective to be a, only a, a cosmetic exercise. We, we understand it as an important process, uh, uh, and it was very interesting to receive to incorporate uh, valuable comments uh, into the rule and to enhance enhance the reach and relevance of it. Uh, and we are working in that, including those comments that make make sense for us uh, to, to include it. And leaving aside uh, the final form of the rule, uh, we have to have in mind that what really matters is the fact that this rule will provide more information to the market in this issue in a context that we have a lack of information about corporate government. This is a reality. And, and there is an increasing demand for good, for, for good corporate governance and for better information about, about good practices. And, and so I, I make the, the connection with the first part of my presentation. There are power, uh, powerful reasons of why this is a very important issue and that we think that we must improve uh, this area uh, in, an, in an urgent way. Final, <coughs> final, as a final remark, I, uh, first of all, well, in order to understand the, the past regulatory change in Chile, it is important, as I have said, to consider the particularities in the property structure in terms of the agency problems that arise uh, from this interaction. Also, we have to remark that beyond the potential legislative advance in corporate governance, there is an urgency to incorporate self-regulation initiatives. And, and for the final comment, I have to say that given the lack of private self-regulation initiative uh, in good practices of corporate governance, uh, the SBS has taken a proactive rule a proactive role in this matter, uh, contributing to facilitate a proper functioning of the financial market. This is, a, is our objective. Uh, is, uh, if the market has provide, provide by themselves good practice and, and has the organization uh, and has taken the transaction cost that all this means, it's not easy to organize that. But it doesn't happen now, until now. And we believe that in this moment, Chile, we have a, a very important necessity to, to give uh, strong steps uh, in, in improving our practices. And we believe that there is a, a strong space for the self-regulation. Uh, we don't believe that the regulation permits everything, no. We, we think that there is a complementary role for the self-regulation and the only that we are interested in is to push the system to incorporate good practices, given the reality, given the the conditions that we have seen in, in, in we have seen in the in, in this in this moment, we believe that the best way that we can do is that to put to the market this obligation to self-evaluate, 
to define some good practice. We are going to change some things that we are we have uh, ana we have been analyzed in the last months, and there are a lot of comments that make us sense to change. We can give a little more flexibility to the rule, but we are completely uh, decided, or we are completely convinced that we must we must uh, follow uh, with this initiative uh, and we are trying to to put it uh, as a, an act of rule uh, before the end of this, year, of this year. Thank you very much. For all of us that have been working on the organization of this event, you cannot uh, realize the feeling of uh, the, the sense of relief that we have because of getting to the final stage of this uh, agenda. So we will ask uh, the finance minister to give us a few words to conclude all the uh, official program of the Chile Day. Welcome, Mr. discussing a very important topic and uh, in a way I also feel <coughs> and um, maybe you feel too a little nostalgic because this is the final the end of the Chile day and I think we will all miss this uh, couple of days here in in London I'm going to talk about uh, the important aspect that has been covered this morning by the panel by the superintendent good governance practice practices um, yesterday, we, uh, we looked at a chart that I showed in my presentation about how Chile has made progress in financial development. And in that particular question, measured by the um, World Economic Forum in the latest rankings, Chile has uh, progressed from position number 41 in 2010 to position 28 in 2012. In two years we have uh, gained 13 uh, notches, 13 spaces in, in this uh, ranking. And what <coughs> does the World Economic Forum say in particular? Well, it says that Chile has progressed in the access to capital markets, well that's the access to financing, that's a very important part, and it has also said that we have made progress in supervision and regulation, so that is a good mark for both our superintendents, the superintendents of uh, 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 Superintendente de Valores y Seguros, and the Superintendente de Bancos, both of whom are here.